Welcome to the CanWatch webinar, Beyond the Numbers, Evaluating Success in Engagement and Outreach Activities. I'm Charmaine Crockett, Manager of Strategic Communications for CanWatch, and I'll be your host for this webinar. And because we're talking all about measuring and evaluation, please stay tuned to the end of this webinar for full polling results and attendance numbers. This is our agenda for today. Uh, I want to stress, though, that this is an informal sharing session. We look forward to everybody chiming in later, uh, just very casual. After the pres uh, presenters share their presentation um, uh, and their approaches and their organization's uh, ways of evaluating success, we've given ample time to hear from all of you, as I'm sure we all have many findings, experience and lessons, experiences and lessons learned to share or ask questions about. Um, we'll have a little help with some conversation starters in the form of some quick and easy polls using our video conferencing software uh, Zoom. I would also like to advise that the session is being recorded and will be posted to the CanWatch YouTube channel. This is to give others an opportunity who are unavailable to join us today to leverage in this learning and sharing. Uh, today's presenters are Caitlin Reed, Communications Officer for CanWatch, my colleague, Sean Power, Project Manager for AMREF Health Africa in Canada, uh, Naomi Johnson, Public Engagement Officer for the Canadian Food Grains Bank, Molly Buckley, Senior Manager of Public Affairs for the AgaCon Foundation Canada, Raul Scorsa, Communications Outreach and Communications Coordinator for Horizons of Friendship, and Courtney Wilson, Manager of Communications and Public Engagement for the Canadian Red Cross. So as you can see, quite a, an exciting lineup of speakers. Before we hear from these presenters, however, I'm going to set the stage a bit by summarize, summarizing findings relevant to the session today from research that CanWatch conducted in 2017 and in uh, 2015 on engaging Canadians. So this research's primary goal, the, the report was called Using Shared Values and Beliefs to Engage Canadians. The primary role of this research was to better understand Canadians' views and beliefs on Canadian investment in women and children's health and international development. It follows similar research that we conducted in 2015, so we had some great points of comparison. It also included some key findings that will inform how and where we engage audiences. This research is being used by ChemWatch to inform the development of our public engagement strategy and campaign that will provide our members with messaging, collateral, and capacity to engage with the Canadian public. Rollout of this campaign will happen this spring, and we've been working closely with our public engagement working group on the development of this work. As for the research itself, uh, it was conducted by Ipsos May 1st to 8th uh, of 2018. 1,004 respondents from a national representative uh, population, 18 or over in, eight, in English and French. It also included belief-based behavior analysis. And this type of methodology allows researchers to immerse themselves into the lives of target audiences and understand the lens through which they view their world. It's a little more in depth and uh, gives them a great opportunity. Similar research, both methodologies were used in 2015, as I said, so we have some great points of comparison. So first, highlight uh, relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. Canadian civic engagement, which is defined as participating in at least one activity, donating, volunteering, fundraising, is down 5%, 68% uh, in 2017, down from 73% 73 in 2015. Interestingly enough, and maybe not coincidentally, Canadians' engagement on social issues via social media platforms is up 5% to 77% in 2017. Um, this is a really interesting statistic. It, it, it shows that Canadians are filling their engagement needs digitally and it poses some questions around what is meaningful engagement in this digital world and how do you measure success in your engagement efforts in this new reality. Next highlight of note, 43% uh, of the general Canadian population and 54% of Canadian youth uh, turn to social media platforms for their news or news headlines. And of that, 61% uh, are going to Facebook. So that's, that's a pretty significant share. 19% are uh, going to Twitter and 18% for YouTube. YouTube has made a, a huge um, increase in uh, popularity in, in just the last couple of years. It was really not very, um, very heavily used for this purpose previously. Um, some other cool facts about this. Um, it's a myth that youth are not on Facebook. They are. 
Um, it's just that they don't engage maybe the same way as other demographics. So they may not be commenting and sharing, but they're there to get their news and to capture other interesting information. Uh, Facebook users spend a lot more time engaging on Facebook than Twitter users do on engaging on Facebook. Um, Caitlin is going to talk a little bit more about uh, the use of Facebook by Canadians and, and how if you want to engage with the public, that is probably your platform of choice. But for engaging with the sector, Twitter may be best. That's where you'll find NGO leaders, politicians, and policy advisors. The research also found something really important is that simple language and messages are essential on Facebook and that you should probably save the talk about frameworks and social determinants uh, for uh, conversations on Twitter where you're engaging with, uh, with our sector and policymakers. So that wraps up my quick, uh, quick highlights. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Caitlin Reed, my, uh, my colleague, uh, communications officer at KenWatch, to uh, start her presentation. And so, uh, She's going to then, we're just going to pass it on to uh, the subsequent presenters and I'll be back on a little later to do a little bit more polling for you. Caitlin? Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all see my screen. I shared the screen. Yep. Okay. So as Charmaine said, I'm the communications officer at CanWatch. And following the research that Charmaine just uh, presented, we wanted to talk a bit more in detail about Facebook with everyone since... It was the dominant social media platform that people were using to get news. And we wanted to offer some information for our members as well as the attendees today on the webinar um, about Facebook and its analytics. So let's dive in. So just a bit of a review from the report. Um, as we know, Facebook dominates with the majority of Canadians accessing it sometimes or regularly to get their news. And Twitter is a very distant second. Um, and what also came out from the research was that people are more likely to engage with posts from individuals rather than posts from organizations. And so we'll just go through an overview. Um, so Facebook itself has a complex internal algorithm and it promotes content in different ways. So for example, Facebook likes to promote its own original or native content over the content shared on it through a third party source such as Hootsuite or Buffer or Sprout Social. Um, um, but luckily it has its own internal scheduling function that it prefers for people to use. And also organic reach or unpaid reach it, um, has been down the last few years. And Facebook does offer a lot of pay options, including boosting ads or promoting your page um, or taking out uh, an ad. But there's also still different ways to connect organically. Um, for example, Facebook groups have still been proven to be quite uh, robust organic forms of engagement. You can start a group on a specific issue or cause like global health or women's rights. You can get your fans and like-minded individuals in the group sharing information. And it's a great way to share your updates and campaigns and things like that. And everyone in the group is automatically notified whenever there's activity. So it's a great way to connect. It's of course um, time, you know, time consuming. It depends on staff capability, volunteer capacity, but certainly something to take into consideration. And also to take into consideration is um, the way that the algorithm works in Facebook. So it's constantly changing. And actually I saw someone message in the chat box before I started my presentation about this next point, which is um, Facebook recently announced that um, they're gonna be changing the way that the newsfeed works because of the controversy around alleged propaganda sites using um, Facebook to promote propaganda and fake news that now even more so than before posts from individuals are going to be favored by Facebook's algorithm so it's going to be even harder for publishers and organizations to get their posts on the newsfeed of their followers and potential followers. Um, so these are just important things to keep in mind. So and it's really good to stay on top of all the Facebook news which is a lot these days. 
Um, so some just general best practices that came out of um, the research report as well as other research that I did. Um, so of course, whenever you start, you should start with a plan or strategy for Facebook. Um, part of that should be, you know, posting regularly, but also posting with a variety of posts. So what's great about Facebook is that you can, you know, you can do the quotes and questions and polls and different types of posts, but you can also do Facebook events. You can post specific job opportunity posts on Facebook and things like that. And those prove to have lots of engagement and can really help get youth out to your events and get people um, aware of your jobs and things like that. So it's always great to experiment with all the different types of posts as well as personal messaging and Facebook groups, as I said. Um, and um, it's also important to take organizations in your posts and to encourage others such as staff or your fans to um, take people in your comments. And this way it can really um, increase the engagement and sort of beat the algorithm and get your reach to increase. Um, and also we think that anything um, for Facebook should include uh, Facebook Live as part of your strategy. So um, Facebook Live is the type of post that's preferred by the Facebook algorithm. So it is promoted over other types. And CanWatch has personally used it um, to success. So for example, in November, we used it for the Justin Trudeau's announcement about the Women Deliver Conference in 2019. And as you can see over um, almost 5,500 people were reached, which is a huge for us. And it, the video itself got uh, 1,600 views, as well as many likes and comments and shares. So we found it to be really useful, and we know that the algorithm likes to promote Facebook Live posts, so that's something to take in consideration when you're working on a strategy. And as always with regular social media best practices, um, you know, photos and videos are always preferred, keeping things short, concise, not too much jargon, as Charmaine mentioned. And of course, m giving posts that are for your audience. So if you want to grow your audience, you should know your audience. And how to do that? Well, Facebook actually offers um, some great analytics, including demographic information. So if you go on to Insights, which is um, Facebook's own analytics function, you can see demographic information such as who your fans are, like their gender, their age, where they are, their city, their country, and the language that they use. Um, and it also shows you information where you can compare with your peers week to week. So you can choose organizations from the sector, get to know um, what they're doing, how successful they've been, and which of their posts are the most engaging. And um, so that's very useful. Also, another thing of insights is it's, it's tracking all different types of engagements, of course, and you can compare your own page week to week, how it's doing with the total engagements plus per post engagements, which is really useful. Um, here's just a sample. This isn't ours. This is a sample I found online of what uh, Facebook Insights Overview looks like. So you can see it shows reach and post engagements and it also shows, has a specific video metric. As I mentioned, videos are preferred by Facebook. But it is important when measuring analytics to keep in mind that not all engagements are the same. So you know, likes are very common, but they're more passive. Shares and commenting are more engaging, plus they'll be preferred by Facebook's algorithm, so it's more likely to be promoted, and so your reach is likely to be greater, as well as tagging people, as I said. So you can track all of these things using Facebook Insights, as well as, of course, those third-party options like Hootsuite or Sprout Social. But it's something to keep in mind that Facebook has all of this information on it itself as well. And um, with any, as with anything that you do, it's important always to experiment, find out the best strategy for your specific organization and your specific audience. So, you know, try all the different types of posts, see what works, 
keep tracking, um, you know, try the different days and different times. Facebook will show you when the most people are online, both day and time. So it's great to take all that information, experiment, find out what works best for you. We wanted to present on some general best practices that we hope can be useful to help you grow your audience. But um, we, I don't know, you know like, it's like, forward. welcome to the Zoom installer, oh. but like it, it doesn't give an option to continue or go back. Oh, like just, um, like, the person on the phone, the 705 number, if you could just mute yourself. Thanks. Okay. Um, anyways, that's um, the conclusion of my presentation on Facebook best practices and its analytics. Thank you so much for listening today. Um, and I will stop sharing and pass it over to Sean. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. Allow me to share my screen. Okay, um, so I'm with AMREF Health Africa, um, and I just wanted to uh, show everybody a, a very brief um, overview of how we approach um, measuring public engagement. Um, so we look at it through a, a, a communications lens. Um, we had a, a public engagement, um, uh, we had a project with a public engagement component um, with a series of live coffee houses uh, kind of winding down um, and we, we were able to find a, a, another um, sponsor but we thought how can we build this into our overall communications program so that we make sure that we're continuously um, doing uh, public engagement and we wanted to um, take more of a results-based uh, management approach um, so we, we really broke down um, why we do communications um, uh, at, at AMREF Health Africa, um, what we uh, are hoping to achieve, what results we're hoping to achieve, and then how. Um, and so, of course, as part of why we do communications, uh, a big part of that is public engagement, um, specifically for target audiences. So I won't take everybody through, you know, the, the, the core of this, um, the, or I should say the details. Um, so we have AMREF Health Africa in Canada has a, has a strategy and a communications plan, um, but there's also a global um, strategy and a global communications plan. Uh, so we, we've, we've harmonized, um, you know, what, what was a priority in, in Canada and kind of AMREF across all of our offices. And then we've also isolated Canada specific um, outputs, outcomes and impacts. So from there, um, we've, we've assigned for each uh, expected output um, or outcome, a target, in, a target indicator, and then a unit of measurement. Um, this is really kind of operational. Operational. This is just how do we get the data, who's responsible for it, and then is this something that we already have easy access to, or is it something that we need? Um, on a monthly basis, we um, track this. Um, you can see all of what we do here with the objectives as section headers. Uh, we do this on a monthly basis, and then we've just got a, you know some some formulas that roll it up nicely for us by quarter and by year, um, and then this allows us to generate uh, some some great graphics on the fly. This this also uh, somewhat in, interacts with um, a global dashboard that that we've got on Google Sheets, and this is something that um, we we try to use across a, a number of our, our offices. Um, and the purpose of this wasn't necessarily to think about Canadian public engagement, but really just so that across our global organization, we're setting uh, some kind of a, a baseline in terms of if we're all moving towards this uh, the same kinds of. Um, results, the same kinds of metrics, let's make sure that we um, are at least creating some visibility around the effectiveness that we're doing. That. So that's um, that's how we do things at, at AMREF Health Africa. Happy to answer questions. Otherwise, I think it's over to you, Naomi. Okay, thank you. I think um, we're doing questions at the end was my understanding for everyone. So. I think Charmaine, correct me if I'm wrong, but otherwise we'll yeah, go with that correct. and I will go ahead questions. forward. I'm going to um, actually, yeah, perfect. Okay, so I will just start off then and then I will have a couple screens to share with you as well. Okay, sorry, just getting set up here. Okay, 
So yes, I'm from Canadian Food Grains Bank, and just a brief background, we, uh, we do programming internationally. Uh, our main goal is to end global hunger, and so we do that through the programming, but we also do domestic work, and that involves public, public engagement activities uh, and getting Canadians engaged and educated about the issues, but then also doing advocacy work and policy work, so um, trying to influence some of the policies that affect those that we work with. Um, just to, to give you a little bit of background about what we track and measure, um, for one, we receive public engagement funding from Global Affairs, so we have to report on that in a certain way. And then we also receive funding from the Gates Foundation for some of our policy and advocacy work, so we're also required to report on that in a certain way. And um, we're kind of, I'm going to talk a lot about the learning that's come through that because we've just finished a three-year grant from the Gates Foundation called our Good Soil Campaign. Um, and we're actually in the midst of putting together another proposal for new funding. And so there's a lot of evaluation and learning going on right now about how we go forward. Um, also to recognize that um, while these reports and tracking mechanisms are part of how we evaluate our work, we do um, recognize the need to have additional indicators to assess some of the tools and methods we use and to guide our planning going forward. And so I think one of the first learnings I would note is that you really need to factor in time to evaluate what the tracked numbers collectively show. So beyond the numbers, what is the learning that's coming from that? I wanna talk a little bit about how we define success. So when we discuss measuring or tracking, I think it's really important that we're clear on how we define success or how we define our goals. And again, that's something we're going through as an organization right now as we prepare for our new proposal. And it can be surprisingly challenging and co a complicated process, yet it's so critical to have those goals clearly defined in order to interpret the impact of the various activities and efforts. Um, so that would be kind of a next note, is to have those goals clearly defined. And I think to remember that evaluation is a tool, it's not the goal in itself. So that should, evaluation should be there to support our goals. Um, there may be multiple goals that you have or multiple degrees of achievement of goals. And, and I think we've learned that it's not really a hierarchy. Um, as much as we may value creating champions that we have, so people who are knowledgeable and engaged and, and self-starters, um, we also have kind of more general, broader goals of, of getting people to just under, have a basic understanding of the issues. And so uh, a key learning was that a supporter's journey is uh, through engagement or advocacy is not linear and that people will take different paths and engage in different ways. Um, Sorry to interrupt, but, Naomi. Did you want me to have these slides up for you? I, no, actually, I'm going to pull up my first one right okay. away. Thank you, Carmen. I just Carmen. wanted to make that. sure that uh, we were, okay, great, thanks. That's great, no problem. Um, so yeah, actually, I'm going to pull up the first one right away um, because I think that once we find our goals, it's really helpful to map out how our activities and our outputs contribute and how it works out. And I know um, Sean spoke to this a little bit and, and has a great, very thorough approach there. And I know some of the other speakers are going to talk about it too. So I just wanted to show you a very simplified example, and it certainly is not comprehensive. Oh. Okay, wait, I have to press share screen. There we go. <clears throat> um, of what that might look like. Mm, okay, oh, there we go. I guess when you have a lot of windows open, there's a lot of options. There we go. <laughs> so is that helpful? Can everybody see that? I don't know, maybe I'll put from, okay, there we go. So that's kind of the full one there. And so again, this is very simplified, but for us, some of our, our goals may be that people are knowledgeable, people are engaged, people are champions. And again, we, we want to accomplish all of these things. We're not necessarily working towards one. And in the um, italics underneath, I've kind of noted our role in making that happen. So increasing their understanding, building their capacity to become engaged. And then when we have champions, I think we really need to build and maintain our relationships with them. And uh, with some of our champions, as we call them, we also have memorandum of understandings in terms of um, how they can get reimbursed for some of the work they do, perhaps, or how we support them. And certainly the consistent communication with them is critical. 
Um, so you can kind of see how some of the activities we have, whether it be uh, educational booths, a hunger on the hill would be like a hill day that we have where Canadians come and learn about advocacy and meet with MPs and, and learning tours are different kind of forms of activities that have different goals. And the same can be said with our outputs. And I just wanted to note that having the postcard there as in as a output to to create knowledge, you know, it may seem as an engagement activity. And I think in some ways it is, it probably belongs somewhere between those two. But one of our learnings from our past grant was that um, postcards are really just, the, the main use of them is to get people to come to you to talk about the issues a little bit more, to get them engaged in the issues a little bit in terms of their understanding of them. Um, Yes, they have some influence in terms of advocacy as well, but I think for us, we've realized that's mostly the goal is just uh, to start to talk about those issues. Okay, um, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Perfect. Um, okay, uh, I just wanted to note that also another helpful way to approach this is to say what would you consider as a failure versus a success? So. Um, we've kind of struggled, for example, with if we gave a presentation to a group, but they didn't take any engagement or actions after that, did we fail in our job? And I think what it comes down to is that it really depends on your intent. And so that's why it's so helpful to have that kind of laid out what you're trying to achieve and to note particularly that the intent that you have is shape, should shape what you're tracking as well. Um, so uh, just lastly, I want to talk a little bit more about measurement and how we start to measure success. So throughout our Good Soil campaign, we used a number of tools for tracking. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you, and maybe I'll just keep sharing this time so it's a little bit easier for you. <clears throat> there we go. So let's go with this one. Okay. Oops, sorry guys. Uh, next slide, how would I do? Oh, there we go, perfect. Okay, pardon me. So um, you can see here that we use a number of different measurements and, and tracking forms, and these are just some of them uh, to track some of our outputs and activities. And yet it was interesting because we felt as though we had achieved a lot in this Good Soil campaign but we didn't actually achieve our policy goal, which was increasing aid for agriculture. And there were a number of learnings that really kind of came out of this experience for us. Um, I think because our, our pol the policy was our primary intent, it could be viewed that we failed. And so, and yet we, we saw um, mention of the importance of aid for agriculture in Global Affairs What We Heard document following their consultation on international assistance. Uh, agriculture was included in the feminist international assistance policy. Uh, we didn't see declines in aid for agriculture in the last budget. And I think furthermore, we really expanded our networks and achieved broad support from groups we haven't connected with before. Um, and really got thousands of Canadians educated on the issues and engaged in the issues and established some core champions who continue to work today on these issues. So what we realized is that we hadn't established the other goals we were working towards um, throughout this campaign. And there was a gap between our tracking and what we felt we had accomplished, which was namely some of those public engagement objectives. I think furthermore, we needed to better align our campaign act objectives with our organizational goals. And so that can serve to broaden the outputs, activities, and outcomes that you can count as success, but it also can strengthen the internal buy-in and that kind of organizational support to achieve what you're trying to do. So that was a key learning. Um, as we go forward with our new proposal, um, we're striving to kind of clearly define our goals now. And so I'm gonna go to the next slide for you here. And, and trying to figure out exactly how we measure them. Uh, so for instance, when I say that people are knowledgeable, what does that mean? How do we show that we've accomplished this? Um, and so you can see here, narrowing down, of course we want people knowledgeable about hunger and food assistance, but we've kind of narrowed it down to one of our goals is that people are knowledgeable and believing and understanding that Canada's international assistance is important to ending global hunger. And on the right side of the screen, you can see some of the ways 
we've thought we measure that or we consider people knowledgeable if they can if through those different measuring systems um, certainly to note learning is one of the most difficult things to measure as I think we all know but we've realized that the more control we have over the learning environment and the learning content uh, the better able we are to measure that learning so that's uh, that's important as well and and we found that supporters can really be our allies in tracking our results uh, we may never be able to fully capture our complete influence on the public but the more we stay in constant communication with those who are engaged or who are champions the more we can measure our actual impact or our ability to be successful in what we're trying to achieve uh, we've also recognized that much of the work on the advocacy we did was underscored by education and capacity building and actually these aspects were necessary to achieving that policy goal and so this is why mapping out some of these goals and activities we found really helpful uh, to see some of those interconnections um, such as so i'm going to clip to my last slide here um, so just trying to understand a little bit whether activities and objectives mutually reinforce each other or possibly contradict each other and so i've kind of just uh, laid out the process i've discussed a little bit some of the points i've discussed a little bit and some of the aspects there in white that we need to consider as, as we go through this process over and over again um, and i think i'll just also note that integrating numerous goals into one activity can certainly be mutually beneficial um, for instance, we have uh, something we call Common Vision, which is a concert. We send out music and educational information to churches and they do concerts where they show a video giving everybody education. Uh, the choir sings the songs and then we also attached in that is postcards for them to advocate with and a donation envelope where they can donate so you can see how we're really trying to achieve a number of our objectives i think you can flip that also and say one activity you have can achieve numerous goals and for instance another interesting thing we recently did was interviewing some of our supporters about why they're so supportive and and why this is important to them and while we use some of that in writing articles and had our purpose for that we also could use that information to tell us a little bit more about our supporters in terms of how we interact with them, what uh, points are source thoughts for them, or where can we get them engaged. Um, so yeah, I think I just wanted to talk a little bit about the process with you there. Uh, as I said, this is a consistent learning, learning process for Canadian Food Greens Bank, certainly as we go forward. But hopefully that offered some help. Thank you. Um, and I will go ahead as well and pass that on. Let me see who's next here. Molly, I will stop sharing and allow you to take over. All right. Thank you, um, Naomi, and thanks, everyone. Um, good afternoon. And um, thank you, first, to Ken Watch for uh, organizing this webinar to bring us all together. And um, uh, certainly enjoying the presentation so far and look forward to the discussion that follows. Um, so I'm going to sh try to share my screen here as well. Okay, are you seeing my PowerPoint presentation? Okay, great. Um, so um, first, just very briefly about Agricon Foundation Canada, in case there are people on the call who haven't um, heard of us. We um, are an international development organization uh, that works with partners in Africa and Asia to improve quality of life um, in those countries. We work primarily in um, sectors of health, education, food security, um, and economic empowerment, and civil society. And similar to what Naomi was saying, here in Canada, that we really seek to um, engage and inform Canadians on global issues and to uh, mobilize Canadian skills, expertise and resources uh, in support of improving quality of life in the developing world. Uh, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about our public engagement program uh, to set the stage for the discussion about our um, monitoring and evaluation approach. So essentially, um, AKF has been doing public engagement work since its inception, really. Um, but about five years ago, we launched launched a fairly large program to educate Canadians about international development and inspire them to get involved. Um, and this project is part of a larger program that's funded by Global Affairs Canada uh, and uh, AKFC as well. 
called the Partnership for Advancing Human Development in Africa and Asia. We also receive funding from another of other uh, other global affairs funded grants, including um, uh, one funded under the PSMNCH initiative. So we apply the same overarching um, approach and ME um, uh, objectives to all of our public engagement work. So within our public engagement program, uh, we focus on a few key target audiences, uh, youth, educators, media, members of the public, as well as the international development community. And I've listed out um, our variety of activities here because it does give you give a sense of some of the challenges that come with one common m and &E system for really a variety of audiences and activities. So we have a large traveling exhibition that just traveled to the country that reached 80,000 people in person. Um, in 57 different communities in Canada. We do youth seminars and workshops. Uh, we have extensive digital and social media. We have a volunteer speaker bureau. We engage with teachers through a teacher's institute, workshops and curricular resources. Uh, events, seminars and conferences, both for public audiences, youth audiences, as well as the development community. And we have a reporting fellowship, which is designed to support Canadian journalists to report on um, development issues and to counter some of the um, reporting around crisis and conflict that we see so much to provide some depth of, of reporting in the Canadian environment. We've also um, really honed in on some of these audiences because we view them as multipliers. And so those um, audiences uh, are educators, media, um, and our volunteer speakers, um, who we see as really those champions who can go out there and reach more Canadians for us. Um, so some, just some pictures of our activities here. Um, but we really believe it's important to have a balance um, of, uh, you know, sort of introductory um, activities as well as more in-depth that reach a lot of people and then more in-depth activities that don't reach as many people. So uh, our approach to M&E. Um, we, um, as uh, some other presenters have talked about, we developed um, a logic model in PMF uh, during the proposal development process with Global Affairs and that really shapes our M&E uh, system. Right after the project we began, we um, commissioned some research to really understand what some best practices um, are in the area of public engagement and, and learning. And so I've just, this is a picture of it. It's available on our website, um, akfc.ca, under the resources tab if you're interested. Um, because we really felt that we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel and should, we should be learning from what was already out there. So that was one of our first steps. The second step was to work with an external facilitator to develop our theory of change. And um, this was a really important part of our process as well. I'm going to show you a picture of our theory of change. So um, we worked with uh, two facilitators. One was sort of the, uh, the main facilitator, an M&E expert, and then the other was uh, a graphic illustrator. And I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of working with graphic illustrators, but it was a great process because she would say to us, I, I can't draw this, I don't know what you're saying. And so it really uh, forced us to very clearly articulate um, our objectives, how our activities were interconnected, and what many of the assumptions were behind um, our programming design. Unfortunately, we did this after we had designed our program. So ideally, we would do it before that next time, but that's just not how um, the reality of our funding uh, cycle worked at the time. So based on this and the research, we then went back and, and fine-tuned the logic model and PMF. Um, on the theory of change, this, um, this has really been a touchstone document for us throughout the program. And we go back to it um, on about a six, every six month basis and look at it and see how we're doing. Was our theory right? Is it not right? Um, and as we come to a close of the program, we're going to be uh, re revising it based on what we've learned over the last five years. So um, what are we measuring? Well, we're measuring very similar things to what other people have talked about. The types of activities um, and audiences and the reach of our activities. We're measuring increased knowledge and we're measuring increased engagement and the reach that our multiplier groups are having. So that means um, what kind of reach is a teacher that we've worked with having or one of our volunteer sp speakers, how many, um, how many people are they, they reaching across the country? Um, so this, these are our results to date. Uh, the program is coming to a close in the next couple of months. So we've reached 1,000, uh, sorry, 100,000 Canadians uh, through in-person activities and about 16 million through digital and social. At the immediate level, uh, based on surveys, about 93% of participants report increased knowledge. And we're really looking at our methodology for that indicator quite a lot. Um, at the intermediate outcome, 
So this is preliminary data, so um, I may have to come back to you and tell you these numbers have changed, but we're finding that depending on the audience and the activities that they've been involved with, between 56% of participants and 92% report increased engagement. So we're really uh, delighted to see that and looking forward to digging into some of that uh, data in our inline study. And then our multipliers have reached um, around 22,000 people. So, um, we, I want to talk a little bit, we carried out a mid, uh, midterm evaluation and then are carrying out an end-line evaluation as well. And although those are sort of time-consuming and costly processes, those have been really important for us to do to really um, get that external view on the program and help us to see where we can improve. Uh, one of the recommendations from the midterm evaluation was that our RBM system wasn't doing the program justice and it, it, was, it was limiting us in fact, and they really encouraged us to look at um, adding more qualitative um, um, data collection approaches. So we're, we've done that in the end line. So the end line um, study has been a mixture of about 40 key informant interviews, a pretty large survey where we've had about 900 people respond. Um, of course, a lot of you know um, secondary data analysis, um, and then um, the collection of some stories that have surfaced throughout all of this data collection to really get at where we have seen change. How how has it how has it happened? Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our learning processes. Um, Early on in the program, we decided that we, we weren't just going to use m &E for donor reporting and that we were going to take this idea of um, learning very seriously. Um, and that's been a bit of a process for us as well. We've, we've realized that it won't happen by accident and you have to plan it and structure it. And so we are really committed, depending on the size of the activity, we hold, um, we, for, for every main activity, we hold an after action review following the activity to really dig into the data and our, um, our own observations and our partners' observations about what worked, what didn't work. Um, for large ones like the exhibit, we meet on a monthly basis and some of our digital campaigns, we meet on a daily or weekly basis. And the idea is we're, we're really trying to move to a, a faster ongoing learning and iteration and adaptation. And um, that's not often how public engagement works. You do your whole campaign, you reflect, and then you change the next one. But we're trying to be more adaptive and iterative midstream, but it's not easy. So you, you really have to plan it and build in that flexibility um, and, and draw on your evidence and data and not just your, your, your gut feelings. So some of our lessons. Um, yeah, well, number one, public engagement is a long-term process and it doesn't always fit into five-year project cycles. Number two, it's difficult to track the ripple effect of our work, right? We really rely on people getting back to us, doing surveys, but it doesn't mean it's not happening if we aren't hearing back. So it's really, um, we have to be realistic about how much people are going to will be willing to engage with us two years or five years down the line. Um, RBM doesn't always work well, and so we have to look at ways to supplement it um, and be more adaptive and iterative. And I think that can be done within the RBM approach, but it's not necessarily how we always use it and really building in those qualitative excuse me, indicators early on as well. Um, yeah, measure what matters and drop the drop the rest. We spent so much time in our early years really focusing on the output level um, data, and we still are, but we've really tried to minimize that because that's not what's most important. It really is whether we are achieving um, the change that we want to see. Um, and um, finally, I think this is my last slide here, measure what matters and listen, learn, adapt, and improve. Uh, so thanks very much, and I think it's over to uh, Raul now. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Molly. Thanks for that presentation. Uh, can you guys hear me there? Yeah, okay, perfect. So let's share the screen here. Okay, and I'm bringing up my slideshow. Okay, are we good? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so thank you to everyone for participating today. Uh, it's very nice to hear everyone talk about immediate outcomes, outputs, uh, so we know we're not the only ones who deal with PMFs. Um, always a joy and pleasure to work with those. Um, but uh, we're going to be talking about evaluating Canadian engagement in terms of maternal, newborn, and child health. 
Um, I'm Rose Corsa and I'm the Community Outreach and Communications Coordinator with Horizons of Friendship. And just to give you guys a little bit of context, uh, we are a small international development organization based in rural Ontario. Uh, we're based out of Coburg, Ontario, but we work primarily in Central America and Mexico, focusing on promoting social justice and sustainable development in the region. Now, we were awarded a PSMNCH project is focusing specifically uh, on indigenous peoples in Totonicapan, the province of Totonicapan, Guatemala. But that com uh, project does have a very significant Canadian public engagement component as well. So very quickly, uh, what I'll be covering is what are we measuring in terms of that? Who are we targeting? What are we doing? How do we evaluate the success of our actions? A very brief note on some social media metrics and some lessons learned uh, throughout this project. We are currently coming up to the end of the second year of the project. So we're actually in the point where we're evaluating what's worked uh, and what hasn't in the last two years. Now, what are we measuring? Uh, so this is, again, uh, we did develop a logic model uh, for the project, but I'll be focusing on point C which uh, is increased canada Guatemala cooperation and understanding. But what does that mean in terms of public engagement? So we're focusing on two things there. So we're increasing knowledge sharing and cooperation between Canadian and Guatemalan MNCH practitioners, providers, professionals, and deepen understanding among non-specialist Canadians on the importance, not just of MNCH itself, but the importance of strengthening MNCH as well. Who are we targeting? So there's three main groups that this public engagement component is targeting. And that's the first one, Canadians vocationally concerned with MNCH, members of the Canadian public that are not specialized in MNCH issues, and youth. Um, why did we choose these? The first one, we thought it'd be more likely that they would become champions. And you've heard that word champions already said uh, in several presentations. So we uh, adhere to that uh, view as well. Um, and we also have historically focused on education on educating the general Canadian public on why these issues matter. And finally, youth, uh, we do conceptualize of youth as agents of change uh, for the future. So that's the reasoning behind those target audiences. Now, uh, the project is quite large, but I'll be focusing on uh, three points of what we are doing within public engagement. Uh, the first one applies particularly to uh, MNCH pro professionals and practitioners that is conducting knowledge exchanges between Canada and Guatemala. And what that encompasses is international visits between Canadian health practitioners, advocates, health providers, so midwives, nurses, doctors, obstetricians, to Guatemala, and having reciprocal visits by uh, Guatemalan indigenous health providers, Guatemalan doctors involved in the project to increase knowledge sharing and cooperation. Uh, we're also having public speaker series panels, workshops with non-specialist Canadians. Um, and finally, we have a youth engagement program with local schools uh, on maternal, newborn and child health issues and how those are important in terms of global development. How do we evaluate success of each of these activities? Uh, and I stripped down all of the uh, PMS cells, this is basically what it's at its core. Uh, we do track a lot of numbers, so number of knowledge exchanges that are done to Canada and Guatemala, number of Canadian and Guatemalan providers, practitioners participating in those exchanges, and the number of Canadians vocationally concerned with MNCH involved in those sessions. Now we do push it a little bit beyond the numbers, uh, we do track the letters of understanding that we're able uh, to uh, establish with Horizons and other MNCH concerned institutions, organizations, and groups. And that's a way for us to measure the sustainability of those public engagement uh, activities. So for example, the picture you see here uh, is a local midwifery clinic based out of Bowmanville, uh, with which we have a letter of understanding uh, to have knowledge sharing sessions and other community outreach initiatives in the Bowmanville area. Now, in terms of evaluating success with non-specialist Canadians, we do track the number of events, uh, especially coinciding with those international visits by our Guatemalan partners to Canada, and the number of people who participate uh, in those events. But if we do push a little bit beyond the numbers again, 
Uh, we are looking at creating a publication on best practices and experiences in engaging Canadians, particularly on MNCH issues. Um, so that publication is not only going to be basically an evaluation of what we've done, it's also a tool that's going to reach additional uh, non-specialist Canadians. And that tool is also going to be evaluated for quality by its readership. And finally, how do we evaluate success in terms of the youth program? So not only do we look at number of youth involved in educational activities and the numbers of schools and youth groups involved in those activities, we also uh, try to do some qualitative uh, data as well through entry and exit surveys, and especially because of the age group that we work with. Uh, so we work with uh, seventh and eighth grader uh, local schools in the area. We try to make these surveys as accessible as possible. So I think really the key learning here is uh, know who you're uh, speaking to and know who your audience is. So you're able to appropriately evaluate uh, those changes in learning and changes in engagement as well. Um, a very brief note on social media metrics. Uh, this is just a table, a sample table of some of the tracking that we do in terms of Twitter and Facebook. Uh, you'll notice number of, of tweets, number of posts, impressions, reach, um, and engagement. Uh, now, a key metric that we find useful uh, is taking engagement as a percentage of reach. Uh, so that would give you an understanding really of um, how do people actually engage uh, with the content that they see on these screens? Are they actually commenting on them or are they just looking at it and passing through? Um, we do have some questions as to what really is uh, a benchmark. Where should we be aiming in terms of percentage of engagement uh, in terms of reach? But we are tracking that uh, metric as well. And finally, just to wrap up, what are some lessons uh, learned? And uh, I've posted some questions that we've asked ourselves uh, that might be worthwhile asking uh, your organizations too, is uh, how do you measure changes in behavior? Uh, so this uh, change in behavior and support has been somewhat difficult for us uh, to track, but we have honed in on the impact of champions. And these champions, at least for us, come really from those knowledge exchange visits because they are instrumental in having those letters of understanding made, in um, hosting events, and in organizing different types of campaigns by themselves. So that's really how we measure those changes in behavior, but I think we could do more robust uh, work there. Um, we are a small organization, so it is somewhat difficult uh, when we host events to keep track of participant attendance, especially if we do it uh, by paper. So we are considering going digital. I know that CanWatch uses that app that I really like. I think it's Whova. Um, I think it's a great way to track how many people are actually participating in your event if you don't have a sign-in sheet. Uh, so that might be uh, useful to consider. And finally, I think Molly talked about this at the end there too, is the sustainability or the continuation of your public engagement efforts. So how do you measure uh, the fact that, you know, once a project ends, is that it? Is that the end of uh, the public being engaged? Um, and I think that the answer would be found in how we measure institutional relationship building, because uh, those relations go beyond uh, the lifespan of a project. Um, and I think that that's some of the key lessons learned there. Um, so thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Oop, wrong one. Ah, here we go. Perfect. And I'm going to be passing it over to Courtney now. Thanks so much, Harold, and thanks everyone and Canva Siege for having us today. Uh, so my name is Courtney and I'm the Communications and Strategic Partnerships Manager for the Canadian Red Cross. Uh, and so like most of you, we have a partnership with Global Affairs Canada. And so I'm just going to pull up here. Um, All right, can everyone see that? Uh, so this is just a fun little infographic kind of about our overall partnership to enhance merit and humanitarian assistance with our overall goal to be to alleviate the suffering and maintain the dignity of the most vulnerable people around the world. So as you can see, we have a few um, target countries in that. Um, but it's also a multi-project approach. And so the one that I work on is this Pillar 3 Project 6 around engaging Canadians, which is kind of what everyone has been talking about here today. So uh, as you can see there, we have three different kind of outcomes that we look at. So we want to increase the awareness of targeted 
um, Canadians on international humanitarian assistance. Uh, we want to increase educational and professional development opportunities for young professionals and youth. And we want to increase the participation of targeted stakeholders um, to improve the effectiveness of Canadians um, humanitarian assistance contribution. Um, so we do this, like most of you, through speaking engagements, uh, through youth engagement. So we actually have a national youth advisory committee that's compromised of seven young people from across the country that um, get together on a bi-weekly basis and they host annual events and campaigns in cities across um, the country to engage youth. So for example, this Saturday we have a social innovation challenge where teams of youth can get together and they are given a humanitarian problem that they'll work in teams um, and present their solutions to for a panel of judges. Um, we do this through um, proactive media outreach and targeted pitching. We ha also have a speakers bureau that we use, um, and then obviously the social and digital side of things as well. So um, how do we measure success? So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and share our framework, which is I think similar to what a lot of you use. And again, this is part of our reporting that we do with Global Affairs. Um, so we have are different so we break our desired um, ultimate outcomes into more immediate outcomes and then obviously we have indicators for the different activities that we use um, so this is kind of the format that we look at this in and so each of these have activities has an indicator uh, sometimes more than one that allows us to ultimately measure our successes um, so overall we have about 40 indicators that we use um, I would say the easiest way to kind of look at this for us is splitting it up between in-person and then digital analytics. So for example, um, at in-person events, uh, we use the number of people in attendance to look at engagement, but we also use an online application called Sleedu. So this is how we garner feedback, um, both qualitative and quantitative for event, from event attendees. And it's a really fun, uh, it used to be an app and now it's just a web-based tool so people can pull it up on their smartphones. Um, so we measure their knowledge before and after a speaking engagement, um, we measure um, their perception of the quality of events and then we get qualita quanti qualitative feedback on um, kind of what they'd like to see more of, what worked for them, what didn't. Um, and so I would say that um, although the quantitative allows us to measure our goals in this kind of reporting framework, that qualitative feedback really helps us inform our, our future direction and activities to better engage people. Um, so then looking at social media, we really look at reach and we don't really look at reach and impressions as much anymore because we see these more as a vanity metric. So more and more we're looking at targeting in on the engagement metrics that we have because um, they tell us more about what's working for people and what's not. And so for engagement, that's all of our shares, our likes, our comments. Um, and how people are engaging with their our content. And so we use these numbers to see what kind of things engage with people and what kind of things don't. Um, and we also gather a lot of data on click-throughs to our website and our blog and that kind of thing. Um, so like I think uh, it was Caitlin mentioned at the very beginning, uh, we're finding Facebook and particularly Facebook Live um, a really good tool to use. And so for example, we have started doing Facebook Lives from the field. Um, so this would be an example just a little picture, I won't actually um, make everyone watch it, but um, this is one of our communications delegates and she is in Nepal. It was around the two year earthquake anniversary. And so she did a Facebook Live with one of our program uh, managers that's a country representative in Nepal. And this garnered some of the furthest reach and engagement um, that we were get. So you can see people can ask questions and comment. And so if you watch through on this, you'll see that Corey has a phone with her and she's able to get questions from people that are back in Canada and then she's asking Richard them and he's answering them. And so we were able to have almost 8,000 views on this and reached over 22,000 people. So on a singular post, that was um, really, really good for us. So just to kind of bring everything together, I think lessons learned um, is the big one. So I think the biggest one, which I know a lot of you mentioned, um, Molly in particular, um, is around being flexible and adaptable. And so I think that with the changing trends, especially with the new Facebook algorithms, we have to be really... Um, on top of what is working for our viewers. And so as Caitlin mentioned, um, people are seeing more and more of what their friends are posting and less from organizations. And so being adaptable and okay, Facebook is still where people go, so how can we reach them? And so uh, we have a network of digital volunteers and social media ambassadors that we use. So they post our content on their own channels to further our reach. Uh, we also do a lot with Facebook ads, particularly around events or live streams that we do. We've tend that to find that that really increases our reach and the number of people that are tuning in. 
Um, and then we also started using other social media channels more and more. We're seeing that a lot of young people like to engage with us on Instagram, especially when we have really good visual content like photos and videos. And so we're trying to ramp up our use of that. Um, I will note that we haven't found a really good analytic system for measuring actual engagement on Instagram, but hopefully we'll get there. Um, and so I think that another thing is too that we've noticed is that um, when people are sharing content, for example, we'll have someone retweet a blog post that we shared on Twitter. And we notice the number of people that are retweeting it is a lot higher than the number of people that are actually going through and reading the actual blog post, um, which is kind of interesting because you think when someone shares something that they're telling people to go and read it. Um, and so we've kind of gotten more into sharing videos and photos and photo blogs that showcase this rather than having people actually have to click through to get more information. So how are we getting the information to our people? Um, and so we really try to listen to what our audiences are wanting to hear and learn about and how they're wanting to get that information. Um, and so that's kind of it for us. I know we're running a bit over, so I'll wrap that up and pass it back to Charmaine to kind of manage the questions. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Courtney. And longer, that's great. But uh, I think we had a couple of questions earlier in the chat pane about accessing some of the statistics that we share and we will definitely make sure that we can get some of that to you. But uh, anybody go ahead, unmute yourself and uh, speak up. I can, I can, I can ask a question. Uh, I'm Kate. Uh, I'm uh, from Shant, Uganda. Um, I'm currently in Vancouver, but our operations are in Uganda. Um, my question kind of just speaks more to like human resources. So um, I uh, manage our communications and our engagement, but I also have a million other things um, on my uh, on my plate. This is kind of one of just one of the things I do um, in our operations. So, uh, do you have any uh, uh, sort of recommendations for people who don't have a full time communications person? I'm going to offer that to any of our presenters to chime in. Uh, one, one thing that we've done at, at AMREF Health Africa is we've tried to automate as much as possible. So for example, the Google Sheet that I shared with, um, with, with everybody that uh, goes over the, um, the various offices across our organization, uh, we use uh, an add-on um, from Google Analytics. Uh, it just, you know, we, we go click, run report, um, and it automatically pulls from Google Analytics and populates um, the dashboard for us um, across any, any any of our offices that, that has granted us Google Analytics access. Uh, the other piece that we've done is we've uh, set up the the Google Sheet um, in such a way that instead of having to you know go to go to Facebook and then uh, go to Insights and manually type in all of the answers, um, we just export a CSV. Again, we just copy and paste the CSV into a Google Sheet into a tab in that Google Sheet. Uh, workbook and then we let the the formulas that we set up um, do, do the rest um, one thing that that uh, we're doing in, in 2018 is is the excel spreadsheet that i shared uh, we're actually moving that to google sheets as well um, because they've got an import range uh, function that basically allows us to to link that so um any anytime that we can automate things that might um you know I, the that, that's how we've we've approached it uh, in terms of trying to minimize the, the the demand on the existing personnel. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, I think just um, I've worked where I was the only communications person. I was part time, and I always found everybody wanted to jump. You know, Snapchat is coming out, and Instagram, and etc. I always find you know know your audience and also know where your audience is you know quality over quantity like if you don't have a whole lot of time think about who you want to reach where they are what's the best way of doing it instead of trying to be everywhere all the time you know really focusing honing in on what you do well and where your audience is and i think first you know and focus on that versus spreading yourself too thin okay thank you I'll just add in there too, um, I mean, speaking from the Red Cross, we obviously have quite a large communications team across the country. Um, but I think one thing that works really well for us as well is utilizing some of our subject matter experts that might not be communicators, um, but that do tend to get out into the field more. Um, so we utilize them as spokespeople, as speakers, and um, we get them to take little videos and photos and gather content from us in the field too. So it doesn't always have to be the communications um, people getting out to do that. And so if you're just one person, that might be something like a 
train your operational people on how to take better photos or little videos, do little workshops so that you can build that capacity within other members of your team as well. Thank you. Uh, this may be kind of an answer question uh, because um, we did, I myself, I'm also uh, the only person for communications, but other members of the team jump in too to help out when they can. And so what we did in the past is we used uh, Hootsuite uh, before to just schedule uh, the uh, blog posts or content ahead of time. But just based on Caitlin's presentations, I've seen that now with the new algorithm, that's not being favored as much. Uh, so maybe any questions on how, uh, or, or any suggestions on how to deal uh, with that, for example. Has, has anyone, um, I mean, the one thing that we do know, not the, and I'm generalizing, the sector uh, tends to focus a lot on its Twitter efforts. Um, and as we've learned, that might be a little bit of talking among ourselves, which is important for various reasons, uh, influencing decision makers, it supports our GR, it supports, you know, uh, certain audiences. But um, I'm wondering if anybody has already encountered some of these challenges with Facebook of late, if you are uh, an organization that's using Facebook quite a bit, if, you, if you've been encountering these challenges lately. Um, which is basically Facebook also channeling you towards buying more. <laughs> Has anyone had any experience on that? I mean, we have, of course, but I already presented on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but just to Raul's point, um, so we do the same thing. So we use the schedule Hootsuite, although we're looking um, to see if there's better options out there for us. But right now we're using Hootsuite. But when I post to Facebook, I do use the scheduler within Facebook and it does um, add a bit more time. However, I find that um, with any schedule, I would be doing separate posts because I wouldn't be doing the same post on Twitter and Facebook. It's different. So um, yeah, it adds a bit of time, but I think that the benefits outweigh the negatives because, because of the way the algorithm works. Um, but also to note, CanWatch isn't on some of the other social media channels, as I said before. So we do try to target our audiences instead of um, adopting everything. We, you know, we are on the, the top three mentioned um, plus LinkedIn. I have a question. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, so a, a little bit like like Kate at uh, Shanti Uganda that um, I'm at PWRDF, a small communications department, and I'm just wondering if, if any of the presenters could um, give sort of a sense of what the the best um, uh, you know what what they get what they gain the most out of doing this kind of m and &E. so just to sort of really make a case for why we should be um, spending, investing our time and yeah, investing our time when we're a small operation in, in doing all this, this tracking. What's the main benefits? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to um, offer a first answer. So uh, for us, it, it's, it's about uh, alignment um, between uh, what we set out to do versus what we actually did. Um, uh, you know, M&E and, and analytics really kind of bridge that gap between what was our communications or our public engagement strategy versus what did we actually, um, uh, you know, accomplish. Um, as, as many um, figures and as many qualitative pieces of, of feedback that, that we get, um, you know, there's there's probably a dozen that uh, that we completely ignore. So for us, it's about making sure that the key performance indicator aligns with um, what we thought we were doing. So that's um, that's the the case that I would you know put forward, especially as a small organization. It's important that that we be strategic and that we that we under, understand whether what we're doing is actually effective in in achieving our goals. 
Um, I'll just uh, echo that. I mean, it's um, whether you're a large or a small organization, you have to make choices about how you spend your time and your money. And so without having evidence to, to back that up, how do you make decisions? Um, so for us, it's really important from that perspective. And my view on it as well is, you know, we would never dream of having an overseas program without um, a monitoring and evaluation strategy behind it. So why would we not do the same for our Canadian programming? I mean, there are best practices around what percentage of, you know, your budget should be allocated to m and &E for for programs um, and so um, that's that's my my perception on it it's it's um, very different kind of work but it's equally as important um, and so the same rigor should go into it um, I, but I also agree with Sean you know we, we may ask 10 survey questions but we and we look at them and we certainly um, feed that into our planning but we don't necessarily formally analyze um, all of them we'll pick the top two or three to um, analyze and roll up and to report on so Great, thank you. We have a question from Hannah on the chat. Um, she wants to know if anyone can recommend any other resources or third party party applications that you've found really helpful. Uh, she's sort of Hootsuite, but, and Caitlin also mentioned Sprout Social, Sprout Social uh, and I haven't heard of that one yet. Does anyone have any suggestions or thoughts on, on, on um, those third party applications? Um, the Canadian Red Cross uses Radian 6 for our social media monitoring. It doesn't do um, Instagram, but we use it for both Facebook and Twitter for a larger organization with a lot of communicators. Um, and especially because we work in disaster responses, it's quite helpful um, in terms of scheduling, but also monitoring because we have different provincial Twitter accounts for all of the different provinces. So it really allows us to kind of monitor everything in one dashboard. Um, it also allows you to assign tweets to be responded to by other people. Um, schedule, flag, potential influencers, potential people that come up with issues a lot of the time. Um, so it allows us to kind of note who some of our top trenders are and people that we engage with. So it's just a nice dashboard kind of that does everything. I don't know the cost off the top of my head, but um, we do pay to use that, but it has been a really good tool for us. Uh, and we just moved from Hootsuite to Hey Orca. Um, and I don't know why, but our digital, uh, my digital colleagues felt very strongly about it. <laughs> so, so far it's working out well, um, quite well from what I understand. Any others have some thoughts on amazing ones? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if the question is specific to m and &E or third party applications in general. We also use um, Buffer at MRF Health Africa uh, for scheduling. Um, and then uh, I think TweetDeck, I think uh, my colleague Jen, who's on, on the webinar, uses TweetDeck as well. Thank you all. Um, I'm conscious of the time that we've kept you going. Uh, apparently we have, we have to make sure we perhaps consider an hour and a half webinars. Um, so I would just like to first of all thank our presenters for the time. I'm going to have a quick poll for you so don't go anywhere yet. Uh, thank our presenters for their willingness to share. Uh, the time to prepare and for the great presentations today. I'd like everyone uh, for taking the time to join us and sharing in the spirit of the collaboration that is our partnership. And uh, stay tuned for future CamWatch Learning Series webinars. We're going to be announcing those soon, so keep an eye on our social media channels and website. And I am going to do a final quick poll uh, right now, and it's just a quick one. And if uh, you just want to answer that. Hopefully everybody can see it. Uh, just to give us an idea of how we did and what we can, uh, and please drop us a line. Um, to let us know what we can do better formatting wise. Any suggestions for those of you who have done similar uh, webinars and exchanges like this. Uh, we always welcome those. So thank you very much. And uh, it was great to see everyone. Thanks for staying on extra. <laughs>